On Tuesday, Florida Republican Byron Donalds got one vote, one, for Speaker of the House of Representatives. On Wednesday, he was officially nominated for that job. Here we are, and for the first time in history, there have been two black Americans placed into the nomination for Speaker of the House. We do not seek to judge people by the color of their skin, but rather the content of their character. There's an important reason for nominating Byron, and that is this country needs a change. This country needs a change, he said. And rather than picking the only member of Congress who kept all the members of his caucus in line and earned the most votes for speaker 11 times now, Hakeem Jeffries, who also happens to be black, Congressman Chip Roy decided, hey, our party can kind of look diverse, too. We, we do have four black members of our caucus, after all, and we can pick one of them. After that rousing speech by Chip Roy, Donald's earned 20 Republican votes during each round of voting yesterday. Today, he held on to at least 13 votes for him and against Kevin McCarthy, who, despite spending more than a decade in party leadership, has proven incapable of making the math work. Donald's, on the other hand, who about 20 years ago pleaded guilty to a felony bribery charge, has just completed his first term in Congress. And until they pick a speaker, he won't be sworn in for his second term. During that first term, Donald's never served in leadership. In fact, he ran against New York Congresswoman Elise Stefanik for Republican conference chair and lost. His colleagues did not pick him. But they picked him to do this, to be the new non-white face of their opposition to would-be Speaker McCarthy. And that choice has not gone unnoticed. Congressman Cory Bush of Missouri put it this way, quote, for what it's worth, Byron Donald's is not a historic candidate for Speaker. He is a prop. Despite being black, he supports a policy agenda intent on upholding and perpetuating white supremacy. His name being in the mix is not progress, it's pathetic. Today, Republicans swore up and down that Congresswoman Bush was wrong. Yesterday, we could have elected the first black Speaker of the United States House of Representatives last night. I sat within feet of Mr. Donalds as the tweet of another member-elect appeared on the screen. That member-elect wrote and sent out to America that Byron Donalds is a prop. He ain't no prop. And if he were a prop, he wouldn't be sitting where he's sitting. This is the tired, old, grotesquely racist rhetoric that we've seen far too long. That's the line. The party that has never in modern history put forward a black person as a potential leader in Congress that tends to vote against policies that would aid communities of colors. Members of that party are not making a mockery of the importance of diversifying congressional leadership. How could anyone possibly think that? Joining us now is Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, Democrat from Minnesota. Congresswoman Omar, thank you for joining me on a day which must already be so exhausting for you as it has been for anybody watching the proceedings here. What do you make of this new priority uh, on diversity coming from the GOP right now? I mean, I, I don't know what to make of it. Um, in one of their speeches today, they talked about uh, the, in one of the nominating speeches for McCarthy, there was a uh, talk of the doubling of the number of black representation, which is now at four um, on their side. And they were celebrating that and really, you know, very excited about that, which we should all be excited for them for. Uh, but we have 58 members on our side um, that represent that diversity of, of America. And I, I really do think that this uh, eagerness of them to show that they have um, developed interest in having diversity in representation uh, isn't really playing that well with the American public. Do you think the virtue signaling is at all to distract from the absolute mockery they're making of representative government? Of course, of course. I mean, there's no other way to make uh, sense of it. Uh, you know, I, I, I think Donald's... Um, 
is is a great guy. Um, they 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 had said some really amazing things about him, and I think that it's admirable for them um, to be able to to do that uh, for their colleague. But this is someone who just um, got reelected to their second term. Um, obviously, someone who hasn't had the opportunity to fully figure out how Congress works, uh, and we know that uh, that someone like that isn't really prepared to to be speaker. Uh, and even today, some of them started to uh, nominate other people and abandon uh, their interest in having him as as their speaker. And so these this sort of shenanigans uh, really is a continued uh, distraction um, of the the chaos that their conference is going through uh, and the American public uh, fully saying, you know, we made a mistake in sending these people um, to represent us in, in Congress, to have this majority that they don't even know how to handle. It's been three days. They haven't been able to organize the House. We don't have a speaker. None of us have been sworn in. All of us are member elect. We don't even know if our staff and ourselves will be paid. We can't take um, cases of our constituents. We have to ask the senators to be able to take care of our constituents. I mean, this is chaos beyond chaos. And McCarthy seems to enjoy the historic humiliation um, that is um, taking place. And, you know, as much as many people would like to rejoice, a lot of us are saddened and disappointed because we realize that tomorrow is the second anniversary of January mm. 6th. We remember the insurrection. We remember that the House was organized. We were ready. Democrats were ready. We'd already elected a speaker. We were ready to defend the Constitution. We were ready to defend our democracy. Imagine if this was to happen under Republican control. Tomorrow, when we walk in on the anniversary of January 6th, we will have no house organized. These, this is going to be the first time in over 100 years where we clearly cannot defend our democracy and our constitution. We don't have the house in order and the Republicans don't seem to be any closer in electing uh, a speaker. We've taken 11 votes so far. All votes have failed. Their leader has gotten less votes than the minority leader. Um, and it is just a, a, a shameful a sight to see, not just for Americans, but people across the world that expect us to have, you know, have figured this out being one of the oldest democracies in the world. I, I, I in addition to the chaos, it also reflects a certain sense of entitlement, do you think? I mean, Nancy Pelosi gave voice to this earlier. She said, you can just imagine what it would be like if a woman we're holding up the opening of Congress, the swearing in of members, the enabling of staff to be hired to do the people's work. Can you just imagine for a person of color? I mean, you see these pictures of Congress people and their families, their babies, waiting around for them to be sworn in, the national security meetings that can't be held, the P as you point out, the people who aren't getting paid, people who can't access their congressionally provided health care. Uh, do you think this reflects a certain sort of mentality about what can be allowed if you are Kevin McCarthy or someone like him? Yeah, I mean, there there is a level of, of arrogance. You know, I, I would assume uh, that anyone else, after maybe even the second or th third uh, failed attempt, uh, that their conference or their caucus would pull them aside and say, you should withdraw. Here's someone else who's ready. And I think that, that this is telling in two ways, right? One, that they're willing to allow this historic humiliation uh, to continue and that he's willing um, to, to continue himself. And two, the fact that they don't have someone else, as he has said, to step into this role. I mean, you have a, a, a conference of 222 members. They don't have anyone else that they can coalesce around to be their leader. I mean, what what kind of um, leadership have have they to show to the American people? Uh, and and you know, I I think it's also really important to remember. And I think you were just talking about this in the previous segment. There's a lot of concessions that have been made. 
many of the members that are the holdouts have said, he's given us everything we've asked for. We're still not going to vote for him. And so I'm wondering, right, does this man want us to be subjected to months to a year of not being sworn in, of the House not being organized? Is he going to sit through, you know, 33 votes <laughs> um, and go back to, you know, 1859? That was the last oh, time that happened. Oh, no. Is he going to sit through, right, 133 votes, which is 1855 that has happened? And again, also, you know, what does it say about you when the objection yeah. to your leadership is similar in history to the objection in leadership that people had pre-Civil Civil War, War, right? Objections yes. that people were making because they couldn't agree on slavery. Yes. That is the level of objection this man has been subjected to. And he still hasn't woken up to that. He still wants to walk around with a smile. <laughs> we know that can't be real. Yes. Um, and and it, is, it is that, right? It is... It is sad because he wants to make it about himself and about earning this leadership that that he so desperately wants. But at some point, it has to become bigger than you. It has to become about the American people. Yes. It has to become about the work that has to get done. It has to be about legislating. It has yeah. to be um, about being effective on, on behalf of the people who well, put their trust in us and who sent us to Washington to represent them. Let it please not take 33 days or months. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, thank you so much for your time tonight. Good luck for the rest of this week and beyond. Send us prayers. <laughs>